Ah, I like it. I'm going to begin by thanking Nancy Miller, Linda Silverman, Michael Husky, and Chris Wells for allowing me to develop this presentation on my own. They have not read, heard, or commented on what I'm about to say. This is in order to protect them. Because if you don't like what I have to say, don't blame them. This is my interpretation of the entire theory of positive disintegration. I want to thank Bill Tillier also for the archive which he maintains and which allowed me access to many uh, manuscripts that have not been published. I also want to thank him for suggesting some readings. I have made sure my presentation leaves time at the end for questions. But if you need to look at a slide longer, just say, wait. Or if I've gone beyond it, say, go back. And I'll try to do that. I am not a therapist. So why am I presenting on Dabrowski, the therapist? It's because after studying the theory for a few years, I've discovered that it is rather nuanced. And I thought perhaps if I looked to see how Dabrowski actually applied his theory as a therapist, I might gain better insights into what the theory was about. So first, we're going to look at what we mean by the word existentialism. Then I'm going to look and see how Dabrowski is an existentialist and in what way. And then we'll look at his application. So get your pen and paper ready. Fasten your seat belts. Because here we go. Except I can't do it. I want to do it to you. There it is. The most fundamental aspect of it. Existentialism is that humans have the freedom to choose. But making choices is not easy. Can you read it? Not only are choices not easy to make, as Kevin and the Hobbes said, so much, they can also have very unexpected consequences. Now I have to try making an adjustment. Maybe a lot of This is a song written by Pete Seeger in 1955. The verses that we're about to hear are the ones that were written by John Henry Perkinson in 1960. 
Actually, what keeps me going is when I can hear a gang of people joining in on a song. So if any song I sing tonight you want to hum along, you won't hurt my feelings if you just do so. A little harmony, too. Pete Seagull, sing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Actually, what keeps me going is when I can hear a gang of people joining in on a song. So if any song I sing tonight you want to hum along, you won't hurt my feelings if you just I'll do so.
So choices are not only hard to make, but the consequences of our choices are sometimes very unexpected. Existentialism is a philosophical theory or approach which emphasizes the existence of the individual person as a free and responsible agent, determining their own development through acts of will. Many existentialists consider traditional philosophies to be too abstract and removed from concrete human experience. A primary virtue in existential thought is authenticity. What does authenticity mean? It means that your values, your ideals, and your actions are aligned and together. Kierkegaard said, all existential problems <clears throat> are passionate problems. When existence is penetrated with reflection, it generates passion. Existential crisis can occur at any level of human behavior. Individuals, corporations, governments, or even on a worldwide basis. An example of existential anxiety is Melissa Bernstein, who treaded the waves of overexcitabilities and parental disability or disapproval. Governments create wars, as what we're experiencing in Ukraine today. Pandemics occur, like COVID-19. Climate change is occurring, and it's destroying our world. What was Dabrowski's existential he says, there is so much evil, so much injustice, so many harm and humiliating. But how are we to understand these comments until we understand what his personal experience is? Dabrowski cited Kabu said that after the First World War, the stone of our culture fell down. Yet still the effort was made to raise it again. When Dabrowski was aged 12 to 16, he experienced World War I. 20 million people died. 20 million were injured. After the Second World War, the stone of culture fell so low that there was no effort at possible to budget according to the world. For Dabrowski, after these, dis these disasters of World War I and World War II, people decided to live harp deal. Latin or seize the day and only concentrated on the day. When Dabrowski was 37, World War II began. 50 million people died. Two years later, in 1941, Germany attacks Poland and at least 1.1 million Jews were killed. At age 41, 
Dabrowski witnessed the 1943 communist invasion of Poland. 150,000 people died. 500,000 were in prison. And 1 million people were deported to Siberia. Now, I want you to think about your reaction to the war in Ukraine. How do you feel about it? What kind of a reaction do you have to it? Now ask yourself a question, what does the words that Dabrowski talked about mean? There is so much evil, so much injustice, so many harmed, so many humiliated. Think about the experiences the man had. Now some suggest that this made Dabrowski sensitive. But what does Dabrowski say? He says it made him a social reformer. He wants to change the world. This is his passionate existential problem, to change the world. Now, <clears throat> A primary cause of corporate, and government, and world existential crisis are created by what Dabrowski called psychopaths. They're also known as narcissistic psychopaths or malignant narcissists in modern terms. But what they are is they are autocrats. And therapeutic prognosis is rather pessimistic and unlikely to work. You're not going to change them, so you better put them in prison. Other characteristics of psychopaths, insensitivity to other people. They don't experience anxiety. They believe their moral tendencies are superior. They lack remorse or shame. They lack the capacity to love. So what is the solution to all of them? The solution for Dabrowski is the creation of universal values. And these are achieved through authentic education articulated by multi-level individuals, eminent individuals, artists, scientists, authors, playwrights, and even cartoonists. Nebraska distinguishes authentic education from training, which is typical of most educational institutions. This is a theme that is not only common in Nebraska, but also for uh, Brett Dopic, who I've had the honor of working with for some 15 years, and his book, the Unconquerable Soul is now, once again, available on uh, Amazon, either in printed form or in uh, digital form. But this is about the experience of a young man at age 18, imprisoned by the communists for 15 years. And it tells the story of getting through that and moving eventually to the United States. So where do values come from? 
or at least where do most of them? Well, the majority of people's values <clears throat> come from following their parents' choices. Or they may go through a thoughtful process settling on institutional beliefs, such as Catholicism or Buddhism. They are people who partake, who partake in a community. The general population is protected from existential anxiety by the acceptance of social roles and social norms. These processes are well established in social uh, psychology and in micro sociology, symbolic action in particular. And that's my training. Dabrowski calls them integrated Buddha level. They're integrated in the sense of into the society and they're protected. But some people become psychoneurotic and nervous with psychosomatic symptoms. These are mild mental conditions as opposed to psychosis and schizophrenia. But they are with very clear psychosomatic symptoms. Hydro, hy, hypochondria, heart palpitations, butterflies in the stomach. Dabrowski calls them unilevel disintegrating. It's really important to note that there's a difference between psychoneurosis in terms of levels. So if the differentiation is on this question of psychosomatic characteristics. <clears throat> when uh, we ask, what is a one potential cause of this, it is narrow uh, or singular overexcitabilities, which he detailed more in his 1938 paper, where he talks about the distance between narrow and global overexcitabilities. Narrow is one sided development that lacks the strength to produce. Lasting inner transformation. One sided development is overemphasis or excessive growth in one area or ability to the exclusion of other aspects of development or through a broad range of interests. Psychobone overexcitability in its narrow form can result in hyperactivity or aggressive behavior. Imaginational overexcitability can bring about inattention disorder or drug addiction. When psychomotor and imaginational are in the together in the person in a narrow form, they result in ADHD. It's the same thing, not different. <clears throat> Other narrow uh, overexcitabilities include sensual, which may lead to pornography and sexual abuse. Emotional overexcitability, which results in outbursts, states of anxiety, and phobias. When sensual and intellectual phobias are together, they may create a form of autism. Unilevel disintegration is best treated 
with traditional psychotherapies. Zabrowski uh, says, these include most classical and contemporary psychotherapies. And there are three outcomes that are possible when people receive treatments for level two situations. One, the therapy may bring them back into integrated utilism. Two, they may stay in the unilevel disintegration, which I call disabled ambivalence. Or they may move to borderline uh, multi-level disintegration. Those in unilevel disintegration experience external conflict, and be tendencies, ambivalences, and their motto is not to decide, which of course is to decide by following what others say. There is limited introspection and self-observation, but no self-evaluation. That last point is a major distinction. At the point of borderline and multi-level disintegration, treatment turns away from traditional psychotherapies. Oops. I meant to say I skipped. Those in borderline multi-level disintegration experience disquietude with oneself, limited introspection, but no self-evaluation. What are you doing about that? So at the point of borderline and multi-level discrimination, treatment has to prove to what he calls developmental psychotherapy. So we have to look at this in more detail. Now, Dabrowski speculates that between 12 and 15% of the population suffers from mental disturbances. And 65% of those are nervous disorders or psychoneurosis. That's about 9% of the population. Approximately 21% of the 65% may be in multi-level uh, disintegration, or about 2% of the population. That's a limited, but it's a significant number of people. Multi-level psychoneurosis begins with global overexcitabilities, which are all encompassing and in combination, especially emotional, imaginational, and intellectual overexcitability. But it can be all five. Here's the important distinction. In developmental psychotherapy, the therapist acts more as an advisor. Their role is to guide the development of multi-level dynamisms. And this is quite different from traditional psychotherapies. Two particularly important multi-level dynamisms are subject object of oneself and third factor. Interestingly, in all the written discussions of dynamism, these two are constantly the first to be defined and described. 
although the list goes much farther. Subject object to oneself is looking at oneself as if from outside. In addition, it's also seeing the individuality of others. Dabrowski and Jossi say that you need to be objective about oneself, but subjective with regard to others. It involves evaluating oneself critically. This is sometimes called self criticism. This is not something a therapist would do with sovereign suffering from PTSD. Are you going to look at them and say, why are you not ashamed of yourself for what you do? Third factor is consciously developing autonomous hierarchy of values. This is self-directed development towards authenticity. Again, it means that you are trying to make your values, ideals, and actions align with them. This requires awareness. It requires conscious decisions. It requires intent. The advisor encourages the development of self-object of oneself through the process of retrospection, and the third factor through the process of prospection. This is where the terms what is and ought to be and what ought to be reside. So you need to really understand what we're talking about. Everybody wants to quote what is and what ought to be. But what that really is referring to is being retrospective with regard to your behavior and what you've done and prospective with regard to what you should be doing. The final goal of developmental psychotherapy is education of oneself or self-education. It is developing a set of methods to teach oneself ways to reflect and learn about crisis management, interaction, and integration with others and the environment. Autopsychotherapy is the application of self-education specifically to deal with psychoneurotic crises and existentialism. Now, all of these processes start to and continue with the existence and the strength of overexcitability. This is the critical part. Overexcitabilities raise the point of neurodiversity because overexcitabilities are neurological conditions. They are not personality characters. So anything that changes the nature of the brain, which is what overexcitabilities do, also affects the behavior. For example, physical drama to the brain. And this is the kind of thing that we now need to look at. The work by Sheila this is very significant here because for the first time we're really looking 
had a fundamental question. What is the difference between excitability and overexcitability? Those two are too frequently totally confused. So we have to set cutoff points. And this is an empirical research question we need to look at because it's only by understanding that that we begin to see why it is that some gifted people have overexcited abilities and others definitely do not. That's really an important distinction. Uh, it's so important for us to recognize that what overexcitabilities do is they create unbelievable tension for the individual and interaction and integration with others and the environment. That is a fundamental aspect of what's involved. So once again, the final goal of developmental psychotherapy is to educate oneself, develop methods of teaching oneself how to reflect and learn about crisis management, integration, and interaction with others. The primary way of trying to interact. Okay. At this point in time, it's up to you to ask questions of me to get clarification on everything I've tried to see. We've only covered a very small section of what's essential human. Dabrowski's actual life experiences and what the differences between normal psychotherapies and developmental therapies. Please raise your hand if you have a question in the room or you can add it to the Q&A in the chat. It's at this point that Linda Silverman will say, You can't be talking about the theory of positive disintegration without talking about binary scanning. You will notice that all of the quotes that I have provided you with are directly from Dabrowski. So my interpretation is based specifically on his words, but the implications lead you into what Michael Bolowski wants to talk. Yes. One of your slides you were talking, uh, I wanted to see if I was hearing correctly. So please, uh, more than what I thought you exactly said, it seemed that you were implying that there's a responsibility to take care of or uh, insulate people who are still at a unilevel. And I was wondering if I was intuiting that or if you were actually saying that. Is there a responsibility for the multi-level people to be insulating or is it the responsibility to help move through the processes? Part of their job is to bring them back into uh, alignment with social norms and social rules and to provide them with education that will get them to think more about how they are making decisions with regard to their values. So that's where the authentic education comes in. And uh, there are two very important uh, non-published manuscripts. One is the uh, developmental psychotherapy, and the other is uh, uh, authentic education.
one, two, three. Reflecting on this construct of gifted individuals potentially not having overexcite abilities and the definitions and varying definitions of giftedness, giftedness in the field, I'm wondering if there's a relationship between that thinking and Dabrowski's or dif the differentiation between intelligence and intellectual overexcitability, meaning um, not um, it, it being intelligent, but maybe not being aligned with those values of authenticity and development towards altruism. Do you have thoughts there as related to how we're defining gifted and if we're looking to transform education? Um, you know, one of the things that Dabrowski really takes a great deal of pride in is the importance of artistic work and creativity. And uh, so, what he's talking about uh, intellectual overexcitability, he's really talking about the way in which the brain is trying to work and, and, and the force with which people are engaged in, in interesting uh, intellectual activity. Uh, I have a hairdresser who reads the scientific affairs. And she and I get to talk about uh, quantum physics uh, while she's cutting my hair. She is not gifted, but she has one very large intellectual role in life. Another question from the chat. Regarding traditional versus developmental psychotherapy, what would you posit about changes in psychology training to provide the step up to developmental psychotherapy? Would this necessitate an advanced degree or clinical rotation? I think the work that uh, Chris is talking about doing in terms of the center and bringing the therapists together to discuss various applications would be the probably the best way because training, you know, you see, I see three modes of, uh, of, of intellectual interest in helping people, coaching and counseling and therapy. And by that, I mean the difference between trained psych, you know, PhD uh, psychologists, uh, social workers, uh, differential training in terms of uh, um, people with master's degree or social work. All of these are combined. The question is, who, who are their clients and how are they relating to those clients? And, you know, not everybody, remember what Kabasi says, only 12 to 15 percent of the population have mental disturbances. And only 65 percent of those have psychoneurosis. So you're not talking about huge numbers of people. A large percentage of the people are going to be a new level disintegration. And um, so they need regular therapeutic uh, avenues that bring them back in to integrated unilevel existence. Thank you. There was a hand over here. Thank you for that. One of the most um, impactful things you said was the fact that these overexcitabilities are a neurological condition versus a personality characteristic. I feel like, you know, so many of us, we've been treated as if we have just personality characteristics, right? You're too emotional. You're, gosh, you make such a big deal out of things. You're so dramatic. Can you talk a little bit more about that um, sort of the neurological side of it? because I've never really seen it as that. 
And that could help, that could help us a lot, I think. The work by uh, uh, Professor Ko, that's K-U-O in Taiwan, has done um, uh, functional MRIs uh, with some people and, uh, and had got access to the MRI machines and was able to locate on the brain the specific areas related to each of the overexcited areas. And they are in different parts of the brain. And that is true for psychomotor, intellectual, imaginational, and sensory, but not emotional. You know, what's going to happen is that the gray matter is where all of the uh, four overexcitabilities exist. But emotional is in the white matter. And it is in something we call the singula, that starts C-I-N-G, you uh, And uh, that goes, it's a pathway that begins in the amygdala. And the amygdala is the center of emotions. It goes to the hippocampus, which involves the history and your all your sort of back stuff, and then ends up in the uh, 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 forebrain, you know, the prefrontal cortex. So it brings those all together. And uh, that provision is from me. That's uh, what I think is going on uh, because we don't have any good measurements of that, but we do have excellent measurements in terms of the where in the brain these things exist. Thank you. From the chat again. Is there overlap between individuals diagnosed with ADHD and traditionally recognized gifted individuals? I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, D. Lebecki is one of the most knowledgeable people about gifted people with ADHD. And she's done research that showed that the higher the IQ, the more likely the person is to have diagnosable ADHD. Individuals at 170 IQ that she had worked with, all of them had diagnosable ADHD. Thank you, Dr. Silverman. Here's our next question. Thanks, Joy. Uh, Frank, I, I was reflecting on uh, the percentages that, that you gave for prevalence of psychoneurosis in the general population. And I was kind of curious, there, there's three factors that, uh, that may have affected that since uh, Dabrowski originally, originally wrote about it. And I'm thinking um, you have the Flynn effect, which is a pop uh, possible increase of perhaps 15 points in IQ uh, between uh, modern Western societies now, and I'm thinking Poland uh, pre-war. Then you have the prevalence of, um, I would say, self-help type stuff in media. People are exposed to all kinds of vocabulary, encouraging them to analyze and think about their inner lives. And then uh, just the general, uh, I guess, rise of postmodernism where people are less integrated around things related to maybe family or religion or career expectations. So I'm kind of curious whether, whether you think that we may have had some drift over time toward developmental potential and access to multi-levelness becoming um, maybe more common or that these characteristics are uh, maybe accessible to, to more people now than they were in Dabrowski's time? Well, one of the things that um, 
I'm going to try and go along around to get back to what you're saying. You may have noticed that I didn't say, didn't say anything about level four and level four. That's because I believe that the multi-level uh, process is ongoing in individuals. And that's why this last slide on the final goal is the education of oneself. Because let's face it, uh, this is the integration of you with others in the environment. Well, others change in the environment changes, which is a reflection of what you're talking So as those change, then the people who have to develop more multi-level kinds of ways of trying to deal with in order to achieve authenticity. And you have to recognize that there's a lot of people at level one that are authentic. That is, their values, their ideas, and their behavior are aligned with them. We may not like it, uh, but uh, that's the case. So authenticity occurs in a variety of, of atmospheres, but it's so important to recognize that this process, learning to deal with crises, learning to move your values as circumstances change become critical. I mean, the pandemic that we're experiencing today is phenomenal in terms of what it's doing to And watch how people are so keen on getting back to normal. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny when you think about it uh, because the virus is just enjoying itself. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. We're pretty much at time, sorry, but we'll do one last question. Um, I'm interested in the last thing that you talked, very last sentence maybe that you said, which was that multi-level disintegration in OEs cause difficulty in interaction with others in the environment. And I'm a professional coach, so that's usually when I get people is when they're having that friction or when their boss decides they're having that friction and then they send them to me. What thoughts do you have about like that was sort of the end of that comment. And I was like, okay, now what? So what, what do you see as the now what or how um, these folks can be helped to also exist in the world while continuing to develop? Well, that's the reason why I said that I think there are so many multi-levels of help available to uh, social work, uh, psychology, psychologists, uh, you know, even some religious leaders. Uh, so, you know, spiritual uh, uh, people. Uh, all of these can provide an avenue. And I think the dialogue that Chris is trying to create is probably one of the most significant uh, changes that we can anticipate. I don't know what you people are going to do when you finally get you get together, but I'm not a therapist or a coach, and uh, I'll be excited to sort of stand back and watch. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all so much for listening, and I hope your shoe belts were on enough uh, that uh, as I tried to change. An awful lot of the way you think about Dabrowski's theory of that presentation. Thank you so much, Frank. Dr. Gallagher has kindly agreed to start five minutes late at 12 at 11:35. So enjoy your five-minute break. And we'll see you in a moment.